In a recent video, I talked about how Betaflight 4.5 now tracks RPM data and raw gyro noise automatically in any of the logs that it takes. You don't have to set it as a debug. I also mentioned in that video how it frees up to set a debug mode to capture other data to compare it with the RPM data. Now, Betaflight is getting in all the logs that will be captured with Betaflight 4.5. In this video, we're gonna take a look at some of the other data that you can capture and compare to the RPM data and just glean what we can see from this to educate a little bit more on things like how fast is the dynamic notch compared to the RPM filters? How fast is the bi-directional D shot for telemetry on RPM data versus just the normal ESC telemetry that we've had for many, many years? So let's check it out and see what we find. So in this log file, we're gonna compare the RPM data, which you can see is this bottom traces right here. And what we have up top here, right up there, is the debug mode for the dynamic notch. And in that case, we have two notches turned on here. And we can see, if you look over here at the table, we can see what uh, hurts the notch is at. And we're gonna look specifically right here. This is a throttle chop. So, you know, doing a little punch out, throttle chop, and then doing a forward flip. And this is the rear motor spinning up. Uh, yes, the rear motor spinning up and then there's a little bit of front motors there to brake and then it going through the forward flip. Then the front motors kicking on real hard to arrest the turn. And then that's, that's that. And what we can do is look over here on this chart. If you catch your, this debug mode and you can see what hurts the center frequencies are of the dynamic notch, the two of them, you can capture up to three. Uh, it'd be cool in new releases, actually, there's 16 debug channels, I think now that we could, I think eight, maybe not 16, eight to maybe it's six, I can't remember. There's more debug channels than four to actually capture all the, the notches and the pre-gyro noise on there. So maybe that would be a pull request somebody can pull together in the future. But nevertheless, we can see two notches. I don't even have three on, I only have two on. And then this is the pre-gyro uh, noise on for notch one. Uh, we're not going to really look at that specifically, but this is essentially this trace right here is the vibrations that notch one is trying to follow. So you can see it's going here and dropping, and that's the reason because see how these squiggles are close together? That means the dynamic notch would be up high at 330 hertz because these squiggles are 322 in this scenario. 322 of these squiggles within one second where over in this area, there's more like 200 some odd squiggles in here within one second. And that, you know, is because we're, if you look right here, dropping throttle. See how you can, the throttle's dropping? Well, the motors are spinning down. You can see the RPM data here as well as they're spinning down. Uh, and this is the motor command. So these are the commands going to the motors and you can see the RPM data spinning down. So, Hopefully you understand what the traces are we're looking at and you can see some neat things in here. So let's dissect this a little bit. You can zoom in on this and we can see, for example, okay, so if you measure peak to peak, so if I zoom way in and we're just gonna look at that one specific notch and I measure peak to peak, you're gonna get around, like I said, 400 Hertz. So 300 some odd Hertz in this scenario where it 398 hertz based on those measurements. And you can do other things like I can do the I and the O key. And then instead of just measuring peak to peak, I could click on this and it will chart all the little squiggles. And it, this is the chart it will come up with. And then I can expand that chart. And since it's just a small little section of the flight, you usually have to bring this up. And you can see this is what the dynamic notch is seeing. And that's why there's a difference between the two. So we have one set of vibrations up here around 400 hertz, and we have another set of vibrations, a uh, peaking vibrations down around 250 hertz. So this is what it's reading continuously because this stuff moves around. Like imagine this kind of sliding around, those two peak numbers kind of sliding around. A dynamic notch is trying to track that and crush this stuff out. So if we look at that, we can see that you know, we kind of have the same thing, you know, one's up at 400 Hertz. Now this is down at 300 Hertz. It's, it was rising. You can see right here, it was kind of on the rise going up from 230 Hertz up to 330 Hertz. As the throttle was increasing, they were kind of coming together. You know, you had these two notches and one was down at 200 Hertz 
I guess I should go this way. Well, this one was down at 200 hertz. This one was up at 400 hertz. And as we were increasing throttle, they were kind of coming together up at the 400 hertz range up in here. And you can see the RPM data. And keep in mind, when you're looking at RPM data like this, you're looking over here as well. If I browse down, it's not just the RPM. They, you know, this is the awesome work that people do in the Betaflight development team. So this is uh, a developer that's working on the, the black box uh, code. Not only has the RPM data, but can simply converted that to uh, the Hertz value, which is simple math, uh, you know, this many rotations a minute converts into that many rotations per second. Um, and that's your frequency. How many rotations or how many oscillations you get per second is the Hertz value. So that's where you would set the notch filter at. So you kind of get two things right here. So you can see as the RPMs are going up, the vibrations are getting tighter and these RPM filters are moving up too. So they're down in the 200 Hertz range and they're following as those vibrations get closer together, you know, faster, the RPM notches are going with it. And then the dynamic notches kind of picking up, cleaning up around the edges. We get this drastic event that happens right here where we Trop throttle, basically, I don't know if it's as fast as I can, but normally just whoop, bring it down throttle pretty quick. And so what do we see from that? Well, this is some of the power you can see with between the RPM filters and the dynamic notch. This window between here and here, because notice that immediately as I'm chopping throttle, of course, the RPMs are dropping right away where it takes the dynamic notch about 50 milliseconds to actually read vibrations of change. You can see from here, you know, the vibrations you can see in these little squiggles right here, right? They change right in this period, right from here to here, and they go to larger, the gap of the oscillation going up and down decreases. So that means, or increases, the gap increases. So that means if we measure peak to peak here, quick, let's get this quickly here and go from here to here, you can see that we're in 240 hertz. It takes time for the system to detect that change. So it's taking about, in this, I would say in this case, about, yeah, 40 to 50 uh, milliseconds for it to register that change and come down, whereas the RPM filters just are following that all the time because they're just following the RPM data and moving those notches right around with it. So the takeaway is the RPM filters are faster to respond to changes in the, the vibration frequency on your frame because they're just being directed where to go from the ESCs directly from the measured RPM data. And it's real time on every loop. Whereas the dynamic notch is great at detecting if there's peaks of noise getting through, but it takes some time to detect it. You know, it takes about 50 milliseconds of detection and then, uh, then it will start to move. And again, you can see that happening here. Now in this scenario, the RPM filters are turned off. So I don't have, I just have the, the dynamic notch as the filtering. I have the RPM filter started off. I'm still getting the bi-directional D-shot data, but I don't have any filtering applied. And that's why you're getting this burst of noise here because of this delay you know you can see in that burst from here to here you're getting this burst of vibrations coming through because although we're seeing the rpm data right here i don't actually have a filter turned on for it i just have the dynamic notch so that's cool but let's talk about esc telemetry rpm data so for many years the escs were able to provide temperature and rpm in a telemetry wire and now with four in one ESCs, it just, as long as you have your connectors connected and there's usually a, a telemetry, a UART that's a part of the ribbon that's connecting your flight controller to the ESC, you just have that telemetry data. Many people use it to display in their OSD, the ESC temperature readings. And if you were in the hobby for a long time ago, there was this big hubbub about bi-directional D-shot and RPM filters, it was a big, you know, big to do. Many people would say over, maybe overhyped, but let's see why some of the advancements in that code were important to what we just talked about there a second ago. 
So in this set of trace templates, uh, similar stuff have just some stick command stuff up here, have the motor traces up here now. So I just moved the, the set of trace motor traces up. These are the motor commands. This is the debug mode, but in this debug mode here, I have the ESC RPM telemetry. And then down here, we just have the bi-directional D-shot RPM telemetry data. So you can see something kind of right away. Look at the fidelity of the bi-directional D-shot RPM data compared to the ESC telemetry RPM data. Now we talked just a second ago about that time that it takes the dynamic notch to move around. So couldn't we have just done that with the ESC RPM telemetry data and skipped all the hubbub with the bi-directional D-shot stuff? Well, no, we really couldn't. We were trying to make, uh, or I shouldn't say, I was there, I didn't code it up, but um, the conversations at the time in the beta flight, uh, I think Slack at the point, was trying to get the dynamic notch to move faster, or what is a way to do it to move faster. And we can see the RPM telemetry data, not the bi-directional D-shot, that's taking 80 milliseconds. So that actually takes longer for the refresh rate on that. Uh, whereas the bi-directional D-shot data, that's coming in uh, pretty much at every loop, it looks like to me. I mean, you can look at these squiggles down here. And if I just go one, uh, one, uh, you know, one little time step there, you know, it looks like they're coming in uh, every loop. So much faster uh, update rate to track the motors and exactly where they are uh, and so on and so forth. This doesn't need to be faster. The point of this was to display on your OSD. Well, you're, you can't track things. That's like, you know, it's less than a, uh, a second. Yeah, less than a tenth of a second that this stuff is updating. So it's updating very fast in human world and human perception of stuff, but computer perception, it's really, really slow. So this is, uh, again, much faster tracking. So just to bring it all together then, so now we have the final log where we did turn on the RPM filter and I just have the ESC telemetry data on here as well. And over here, this is the dynamic notch one, the first one we looked at. And you can just see at the top here, once turning on that filtering, uh, obviously I'm turning on more filtering. I did take the dynamic notch and adjust the Q factor from a 300 to a 500, but it is more filtering. And you can see the result that the tr motor trace, the motor commands are not so, you know, this is the old one here. Without the RPM filters turned on, you can see the thickness of these lines, a little thicker. And over here, it's a little thinned out. So the commands aren't as jumpy that it's giving the motors. Do note, though, that, you know, the motors can't spin up that, you know, change frequency as fast as these little jiggy jags are going in here. So the RPM data that you're getting back, at least on the reading part, is about the same. That said, just because the motors can't physically change rotation that fast, it doesn't mean the FETs on the ESC and the magnetic fields in the motor aren't trying to get the motor to change faster, which generates heat. So the more spiky your motor commands are, yes, your motors won't be able to follow that spikiness or they would it would have a grinding sound like crazy. So the motors physically aren't, but those magnetic fields are switching a lot more back and forth and oscillating, you, you, if you could see it, you'd see these magnetic fields being a lot more jittery. Uh, and the and that's gonna add heat to your motors. That's gonna add heat to your ESCs because your ESCs are ramping and changing all the time. So that's where you get into, if you don't have enough filtering, those motor commands are a lot more spiky and those are gonna generate heat in your motors and heat on your ESC. And if I would run a spectrum analysis of that, so this analysis is essentially just looking at the frequency of the oscillations going up and down. You can see there's a whole range throughout the entire flight. And there are two different flights, so there's going to be anomalies in between the two. But this is the one without the RPM filters turned on, and this is uh, doing that on motor command number one, uh, motor trace for motor command, or the trace for motor command number one and then doing the same thing with the RPM filter turned off and everything else the same. Um, and you can see how it's, you know, a little less, little less uh, vibration being commanded to those ESCs and those, and those motors. And I was just looking at this one, you know, for example, here, you know, we're doing a, a forward uh, flip again, and you can see that the motors ramp up and ramp down 
and it kind of ramp up and they almost well, we'll miss one they ramp up and start to ramp down and then the esc te telemetry data even recognizes that they ramped up to begin with and it holds high until it comes down and kind of sees over here so it's it's just way behind you know the esc telemetry data which again fine for the osd but not so great for you know moving filters around and i think that becomes important when it comes to inav because inav's rpm filter doesn't use di bi-directional d shot it uses esc telemetry data so if you're on a big rig flying around or you're just doing some cinematic flying I don't think it matters because the RPMs of the motors aren't changing that much to begin with. But if you're doing dynamic flight, freestyle, uh, racing, yeah, it's going to make a difference. Your motors are changing RPM all over the place, especially in racing. And that's just going to be, you know, at the end of the day, INAV's RPM filtering is not going to be as good as Betaflight's RPM filtering. They're two different things. And it's not so much the filter, it's where is it getting the data to actually center those filters and follow the motor RPMs? Okay, well, that will do it. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to drop them down below. Hope you found this interesting. I just wanted to make this video just because it's observation I had and I wanted to get it out there. Thanks, everybody. I'll see you on the next one.